spiked out. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from. Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. It's episode number 60. We are we're just cooking. We're cooking with oil. Can you feel it, Tyler? What kind of oil? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it just feels like we're, 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 we're moving quickly. The show is getting tighter and tighter. Uh, and the guest level is increasing. Uh, today's guest, I am absolutely stoked about. He must be awesome because you've got a whole arsenal of weaponry over here. You know, uh, I ha- I'm suffering here. from <laughs> headaches. I've brought this up on the show before. I've never had headaches in my life. When people said I have headaches, uh-huh. I was laughing. I'm like, what are you such a baby for? Headaches? It's like a psychosomatic thing. Now I am suffering from headaches every couple of days. I think sometimes lack of sleep causes it, other times stress, I don't know what's causing it, but I have had a headache for 24 hours. It feels like somebody hit me with a bat in the side of the head, and I have swelling in my head. Just nonstop headache, and there is absolutely no relief for it. Zero. Have you changed your diet? No, I'm not changing my diet, I'm drinking enough water, I don't know what it is, but it might be that I'm just doing so many things that my brain is on overload. Every project has gotten bigger than the last. And you know this because you sit here and you watch it. This weekend is now becoming a juggernaut. There's 10 employees at this weekend. There's 15 shows. I can't keep the network in my head. And then I'm getting emailed by dozens of people who are incredible people saying, your guys at this weekend are not calling me back. And you know, they, I have this great idea for a show or I want to sponsor oh. this. And it's becoming that moment like we had at Weblogs Inc. or at Mahalo in the early days when we were understaffed and it's just drowning in opportunity. Right. There's just so many people who want to get involved with This Weekend and they can only launch two or three shows per week given the size of the staff. Right. And They want to do it from their home in Saskatchewan or whatever. Whatever it is, yeah. yeah. And then uh, the launch conference now, we have a date of February 23rd and 24th. Mm-hmm. This is going to be huge. Everybody's emailing about the launch conference, the launch conference, launchconference.com. What days is it? Where is it occurring? It's occurring in San Francisco. It's going to be at the San Francisco Design Center. It's going to be February 23rd and 24th. Now people want to know where they can buy tickets. They want to know when the website's going to be redone. They want to know who the speakers are, how they apply. I don't have any of that stuff done. And we, it, there's only so many hours in the day. I've got you on the special project you're working on at Mahalo. I am run out of bandwidth. i got to play in the World Series of Poker in another 10 days. I'm trying to get some poker in. And then I've got idiots on my Twitter stream taking the last little bit of energy I have. So, like, I have basically these SEO haters on the Twitter stream, like, oh, my God, you changed the revenue model of Mahalo. You went from revenue sharing to um, paying people a flat rate. You, uh, you've screwed everybody over. I'm like, listen, I created revenue share. That was my idea. It didn't work. It didn't scale. Nobody's more upset about that than I am. And it was the writers at Mahalo who lobbied to not have revenue sharing anymore and instead to get played a flat rate every week by PayPal and they feel more comfortable with that. Fine, I'm not going to argue when 19 out of 20 people tell me I'm wrong, I'm going to go with it. But then the all the SEOs come out of the woodwork and they just, they all, so I'm going to basically, you know, as I always do, I try to turn lemons into lemonade. This Friday is going to be an all hater episode of This Week in Twist. It'll go down in history as one of the greatest episodes oh, ever. Oh, we did that on Calacanis We did that on Calacanis cast. cast. It was very innovative back yes. in the day when you were involved in the original uh, This Week in Startups. And we're going to have an all-hater Friday. So we've got um, this one guy, Stitchco or whatever, who's just massively been hating. He's like an SEO who lives in his mom's basement or something. Uh, and then hopefully we'll get Aaron Wall on. Mm-hmm. But Aaron Wall likes to throw rocks at the throne. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't like to come into the arena. So he'll probably... What's the word? I don't want to say an inappropriate word on the show, but he will probably not show up because he's a coward. Then, last night, I'm like, hey, did, can any, anybody want to help with the logo of the launch conference? Because I'm not crazy about the logo. We did, we did a little contest on 99designs. It was too, I want like a Ted kind of a logo. And so I do a question on Mahalo Answer saying, anybody want to, does have ideas for a logo. Just anybody have ideas. I put a $7 tip on it. Just ideas. Yeah. Then this woman, this is hater number two, yesterday starts 
wailing on me. How much are the tickets to the event? How mu when is the event and how much is the tickets? I'm like, well, I'm just asking for a logo, but I don't know what the tickets are. How many people are coming? And I'm like, how many people are coming? I don't know, 500 maybe, maybe 1,000, I don't know. How much are you charging them? And I'm like, okay, now I know where this is going. You're one of these designers who is gonna then go calculate how much money the conference is gonna make, yeah. like a knucklehead, and then tell me, oh, you, you're not willing to spend 10% of the conference revenue on a logo? You should spend 50,000 or 100,000 dollars on a logo. Guess what, that train has left the station. There's a million people in India and the Philippines and China who will design a logo for $300 for you that will look as good as the greatest design firm in the world. And if I, I, we should do this as a test, just to make this knucklehead realize what a knucklehead she is. We should get a $300 logo made in India, and then we should get some of these crazy design firms to do a $30,000 logo, and then we should have people try to figure out which is which. Right. <laughs> I guarantee you it's gonna be 50-50, nobody's gonna know the difference. Anyway, all haters are welcome to be on the show on Friday. And then, you know. Who's to say the design firm isn't outsourcing to India anyway? Of course, you know, and then like, it, what business is, of, is it of yours if, you're, if you are privileged enough to follow my Twitter feed, honestly, how dare you? But most of these web places that, you know, they, they want your business and they, you know, they have a U.S. facing guy who, yeah, of course. who is I, doing it on the back end. There was like, a great story on, uh, uh, on Slashdot where this guy had two consulting gigs for like $100,000 each and he hired four guys in India for $10,000 each and had them write the code and then submitted the code as his own. And he was like, is this ethical or not? And everybody's like, rock on, you know, whatever. If people can't tell the difference, that's fine. But let me pull up this woman because she was such a, oh. So annoying. And so then I'm like, okay, I know this person's a designer. So then I'm obligated to click on their link to see their designs. I click on the link, and it's literally the worst designs ever done in the history of design. Does anybody know this person's name? She was all over my Twitter feed yelling at me yesterday, and there's so many people who responded. Oh, God, you know. And then the Tesla IPO happened today, and I had to get all busy with that. I bought 10,000 shares. I'm really psyched about that. Um, and, and just so much going on in such a short period of time that my brain feels like it's going to explode. Here she is, Mixy, M-I-I-X-X-Y. I'm loading her right now on my screen. And uh, so Mixy wants to mixy it up with me. And I'm like, Melissa Alto is telling me what a terrible, you know, how terrible I am. How dare you, blah, 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 blah. And then she gets in touch with the SEOs. So now I've got the design people who hate me for asking my friends to do a design. And some of these designs came out brilliant as, as people who follow, my, follow me on at Jason. Then she feels like she's got to get in touch with the, now I've got all the design people who are part of this no spec movement. You can't do any spec work. Right. God forbid people make their own decision in life. Right. Like if I'm a designer, I'm starting off. If I want to make a free logo for Jason Calacanis or Mark Andreessen or Kevin Rose, I'm entitled to do that. How dare you? tell these talented young people they can't do some spec work. If they want to do spec work, do spec work, who cares? I guess internships would fall under the same sort yes. of... Yes, oh no, you cannot do an internship <laughs> ever because that precludes my ability to make a living. Yes. And of course, the people who do this are the most talented, talentless people in the world. So look at her website. By the way, if you're gonna throw rocks at me and then produce this ugly graphic from zero to 90, and then like, I'm looking at these websites that she designs. First of all, there's the Flash website. Like who, who's doing a Flash website and, and considers themselves a real designer? And I'm, I'm like, look at these designs. It's just absolutely terrible. This, I mean, really? You're telling me that I can't get designs and then you produce this garbage? Oh. Unbelievable. And yesterday I had to take Taurus to the hospital. He got stung by a bee or something. His whole face blows up. I'm losing it. I'm absolutely losing it. And I can't not hold back and tell people they're idiots anymore. And I'm not supposed to do that. So to the idiots, this is a message to stupid people who are on Twitter. Do not follow me if your IQ is below 70. Please. Because if you follow me and then you start chiming in, I can't help myself and then I have to talk to you. And then I'm talking to idiots and then it's the end of my life because you're taking up my time and I'm busy with a lot of projects, okay? And I am not going to pull back and, and not fight the fight. And now all these haters know that. So now they know exactly how to push my button. They know exactly like, oh, if I just link bait Jason, he's gonna come out swinging. That's what he does. I need to 
go to anger management or something. And somebody called Dr. Mark Goulston to come in and explain to me how I cannot engage these people because it feels like my obligation. Is it hot in here? Am I dying? Or is it just because I'm absolutely having... It's the lightsaber. Is it the lightsaber? Yeah. I f I'm going crazy. And so I got lightsabers, and I've got Chinese stars here, and I, I just, ev I gotta go to war with everybody. I, I, every single person is got to attack me. These don't, not, these Chinese stars don't even work. They're not even going into the wall. There we go, boom, right in the wall. Anyway, it's madness, and I have to stop engaging people like this, and start engaging intelligent people. Uh, and so that's my promise. No more, after Friday's show with the haters, that's the end of engaging haters. This is the end for me. I will not engage any haters ever again. People who complain about product or the way I do things, I'm just not gonna even talk to them. It's gonna be all hater Friday and then a no hater decade. Literally, I'm never gonna engage a hater again, ever. It's over. Thank you to Drobo for setting up the studio with a ton of Drobo units. Drobo, Drobo, Drobo. These are intelligent people, and if you're an intelligent person, you'll get a Drobo unit because they just work wonderfully. You've seen this thing in action here, Tyler. Yep. I mean, that's what I have, the Drobo Elite. They sent me one of these things on the arm. That means for free. You can't, I got the, you can't really do anything in video without it these days. If you're video production, you have to have a Drobo. That and the Explain how it works, <clears throat> Tyler. But I was going to say that and the TriCaster. It's kind of like two of the secret sauces that's the one you're doing. That's yeah. the one-two punch. Explain what the Drobo is. The Drobo is really smart hard drive swapping. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, it's more than just linking a bunch of hard drives together because it intelligently moves the files to the most intelligent place for you. RAID. So, yeah. Well, yeah, not everyone knows. Right. Um, that means if one of the drives fails, yeah. you're the, there's copies of the stuff on the other side. Yes. Anyway, we have these Drobos here. And if you, you don't have to turn them off. You just plug in a new $99 hard drive without the rails on yeah. it. You know, like you get on like Newegg or one of those places. Boom, you just plug it in, it works. It rebalances everything. And Jerobo uh, solves your whole problem for you. So thank you to Jerobo for supporting this weekend.com and the 15 shows growing up to 25 uh, on the network. It's a great product. I love it. We have, I think we have three of them here. And I have one at home. And it's still not enough. We have terabytes and terabytes now of storage, thanks to them. Uh, on the program with us today is Neil Young. I know it's a, everybody's going, wow, that's a pretty significant guess. You've got Neil Young. Uh, it's not that Neil Young. It's another Neil Young. Uh, but I am as addicted to Neil Young's product as I was Neil Young's Harvest when I was 15 years old. Harvest Moon. Yeah. Uh, Harvest Moon. What an incredible one. Uh, can we get the AC on in here, by the way? It, I'm dying. and I, I, I'm sorry for the hum of the AC, but... Um, Neil Young is the CEO of NG Moco. NG Moco, you probably haven't heard of, but you you're have- You're gaming, you- Well, okay, yeah, you might know that name, but the name you're definitely gonna know if anybody who's got half a brain, and obviously there's a large percentage of my Twitter followers who do not, but for, the, for those people who have half a brain, if you go to the iPad store, iTunes store, on your iPad or your iPhone, they are consistently in the top 10 applications for multiple applications. So the first thing you do when you get an iPad is you look at all the free applications and you add stuff, right? And then you look at the top 10 and you might add some of the other things that are paid. But everybody adds this stuff. Lo and behold, I get an email from a very, this is how I found out about this company. I get the iPad and then I get an email from one of the highest profile investors in the world saying, I'm inviting you to my kingdom. Can you please uh, you know, click here and join me in my realm and whatever. And I'm like, why is this high profile investor asking me to play Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, you know? And I load this game called We Rule on my lap, on my iPad. And I get, if you show my iPad here, you can see my kingdom in We Rule. This takes 15 minutes of my life every day for at least three weeks now. I, this is the number one application on my iPad. And what it is is it's a little game where you plant things on your farm like right now, I've got the, the, the uh, magic cauliflower going. And then you can buy things like these special trees that have rubies. And then I click on them to harvest the rubies, as you can see I'm doing do, 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 do. And I get experience points. And then I get gold. And then I can do trade with these other people who want to buy stuff from my different stores. And now that I've made a little bit of money, I can spend it and buy another store. It is the most addicting thing I've ever seen on the iPad ever. 
And so I said, I, we have to get the guy who makes this on the show because now I, f I tweet that I'm using this and I have hundreds of people who are also using this. This is collectively causing at least 100,000 hours of, of what, what, was, what is uh, Clay Shirky called? Uh, cognitive surplus? This is 100,000 hours of cognitive surplus per day. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm gonna find out in a minute. Uh, Neil Young, welcome to the program. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, many apologies for you having to sit through that embarrassing rant, uh, but no I'm, I'm sure you've never had to, in your line of business, deal with people who maybe are unreasonable and are emailing you and tweeting you because they're magic cauliflower, they couldn't log into the system and harvest their magic cauliflower and it's spoiled. That's never happened. No, never, never happened. You know, 100% <laughs> of our customers are uh, happy 100% of the time. So tell me about your company. When did you start this company? Uh, and how is it doing? Because, I, like I said, I hadn't heard about this company. I mean, I hear all the time about Zynga and Farmville on Facebook. But then I, I start playing this thing, and I realize everybody in the world who has an iPad seems to be playing this game. How long has the company been around? How many people work at it? When did you found it? Yeah, we started the company uh, June 26th of uh, 2008. And, um, you know, I used to work for Electronic Arts, which is a big uh, traditional video game company and was a group general manager there and um, really fell in love with the iPhone and uh, felt like it was a, sort of an inflective moment in gaming and that felt like a great opportunity to, to start NG Moco. Um, we, um, you know, we raised a, a round of financing when we started the company from, from Kleiner Perkins and uh, kind of went at it really, really hard. So uh, today, you know, we have uh, NG Moco, the brand NG Moco has launched about uh, 25 applications. Uh, we've had 16 apps in the, in the top 10, um, many of those number one. Uh, we have about 110 people now uh, between San Francisco, uh, a company we acquired in New York, which is Freeverse that makes Skeeble, which is another sort of perennial uh, app on the, uh, on the iPhone, and then a small team in, in, in Portland. So, you know, we've been going at it hard and, and, and trying to build a, a great business. I think probably the most, you know, inflective moment in the life of our company was last summer where we made the decision to switch our business predominantly to free-to-play. And that spurned a lot of the thinking that, that powers, you know, we rule and, and Godfinger and eliminate and, and, and touch bets. Um, this game, we rule, how many people have downloaded this application and how many people play it every day? Um, it has been downloaded by about uh, two and a half million unique um, people. And uh, we don't talk about the specifics of the daily active uniques, which is, which is what we care about in the business, but uh, it's in the high hundreds of thousands. And uh, those customers tend to kind of come back on average, you know, every other day and, and play um, sort of five to six sessions uh, a day. What is, so basically, two and a half people, two and a half million people have downloaded the application, and then if there's high hundreds of thousands of people who are playing it, you've got some sick retention rate of like a third or 25 percent of people playing this every day or every couple of days. What do you credit the addictiveness of these games? Because I was, you know, I'm addicted to poker and gambling. People know that. I'm addicted to. Um, or, or I was addicted to like Age of Empires or Command and Conquer, those kind of games have a natural addiction. World of Warcraft, I never really played, but that has a natural addiction. When you're killing people. But this game has no killing in it. There's no murder like in poker, there's no murder like in a Age of Empires. What I'm astounded is without any battling or fighting, just building things up, this becomes addicting. How, how is this game so addicting to people? Is there some dopamine that is released when people level up and when they power up? What is the science behind this? So you, you must think about these things. Yeah, we do. I mean, there's really, um, you know, one is the core compulsion loop of the game itself. And, you know, most great video games are um, a, you know, tightly wound uh, loop. And, uh, you know, if you took Diablo as an example, a traditional video game, you know, I basically kill enemies to get gold in order to buy things that allow me to you know, uh, kill things better, and you repeat that loop. And then at some interval, I'm also getting experience points that allow me to level up to buy better things that help me kill things. You know, so video games, ha great video games have at their, their core 
simple uh, compulsion loops. And I think what we've been able to do with WeRule is we've taken, you know, um, a great core underlying compulsion loop that allows you to, you know, earn and uh, unlock and, and, and level up. And then we've combined it with two really important things. Uh, one is social expression. Um, so, you know, your kingdom is a unique design to, to you and you know that there are other people visiting that kingdom. And so you, you know, you get a thrill and a rush out of, you know, making sure that kingdom is as perfectly organized or, you know, a reflection of the way that you perhaps see the world. And then the second is social obligation. And, you know, when you're ordering jobs or uh, responding to jobs, you're essentially buying into the, the loop of so social obligation, which is, you know, you've been trained as a human to, you know, to, you know, to, to respect. When you get a push notification that says that, you know, uh, you know, Neil has ordered, um, you know, a hundred broomsticks from your uh, kingdom, will you accept? Um, it's actually difficult for you to say no. You know, you've been trained really just to say yes your entire life to, you know, uh, to engaging in those things. And so that's, that's really the, you know, the sort of the psychology uh, behind it, the ability to express yourself in a social forum and then the ability to participate in transactions that are rewarding to both you and others. I heard the word reciprocation, um, compulsion loop, and social obligation. Uh, you know, are you a psychology major, or do you have psychology people working in your organization to think about these issues, or is this just like you have a bunch of tech people and product designers who maybe have read the Wikipedia pages on these psychological terms? Do you actually have like PhDs in psychology and psychology majors creating this stuff? No, we don't. I mean, we're game makers, and uh, we have just learned these things as we've been in the business of, of building games. You know, I started as a programmer, and it turns out I was a pretty shitty programmer, so I did what all shitty programmers do and became a manager. And uh, then from, from there, I figured out that what I was great at was producing and, and designing, uh, designing games, and, you know, started, you know, trying to perfect that, that craft. And, you know, at NGMoco, we try to do two things. We try to, you know, hire uh, and grow the very best uh, game makers in the world and then combine that with, you know, the, the best analytics, you know, so that we can, you know, ultimately try to build the best experiences. But, you know, we, uh, we have learned or invented, you know, these terms candidly through experience and, and trial and error. I mean, we make a lot of mistakes. We fuck up a lot. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, I think it's the internet. You can curse as much as you want. It basically creates a little bit of work for the editors who have to bleep it out so we don't lose our iTunes rating, but I don't give a shit. I don't have to do it, so that's their problem. Uh, reciprocation, reciprocation, the reciprocation effect. Uh, this is a very powerful driver in psychology. Uh, I was a psych major. Uh, and in reciprocation, this is what uh, the Moonies do, right? Is that Moonies isn't a derogatory term, right? When you were a Moonie, did... Hare Krishna is a Yeah. yeah. I'm calling the Moonies, is that derogatory? I, I'm not familiar with that term, but I knew who you met, oddly. The Moonies are the bald folks. That's why I thought you maybe you're yeah. associated with these guys. Right. No, you never spend any time <laughs> with them. They shave their heads, and then they, give, and they go to the airports, they're dressed in some kind of garb, and they give you a flower. Uh, they don't like the term Moonies, I don't think so. Okay, Lon tells us that's not. Okay, I, I, who can keep up with what everybody's sensitivity training is? But anyway, they give you a flower in the airport, and you're like, oh, thank you, I, I didn't want this. But then they say, oh, make a donation. So there, that's the reciprocation effect right there. Uh, and then, uh, if you ever seen Schindler's List, the guy in that who, like, he sends gift baskets to everybody, buys them a bunch of drinks at the club, and then all of a sudden, you know, when it comes time to do business, it's very difficult. Like, this guy who's a money manager in L.A. for my friends got tickets to the Lakers finals. My friend invites me to the Lakers finals, and now I'm going to dinner or breakfast or lunch or something with their team. And I'm like, how did I wind up doing this? And like, oh, yeah, they bought me tickets to the Lakers finals. I didn't know exactly that that was what the reciprocation was going to be. But how do I say no to the lunch? i got to hear the guys out because that must have cost them a G or two to get me those tickets. Um, when you do this stuff in the compulsion loop and the social obligation, uh, how powerful is it? Tell me about the top 10 users in the system and what they do and their behavior pattern. There must be people that you watch in this system and shake your head and say, I cannot believe that these people are playing this for how many hours a day? I think we may have lost him. 
Do we lose Neil? He's doing a uh, Kevin Pollock. Is it a Kevin Pollock stare? Yeah. <laughs> my my question was so long and boring that we uh, we dropped the Skype. Yeah, I mean the. Oh, here we go. Oh, connection loss, brutal. Um, <laughs> that was funny. This game, though, hey, you play any of these games? No. You I, know, I know they're addictive, so I don't play them. Yeah. You don't have an iPad. I don't have an iPad. I offered to get you an iPad and buy I you don't. one. Why didn't you get it? What's the resistance? I get more of a thrill out of uh, resisting free. Well, it's like it's like the flower. I just say. Oh, you it's know. a reverse flower. <laughs> it's a reverse reciprocation. Yeah. I offer you something, you say no. Yes. And then it makes me feel like I have to offer you ten <laughs> times that and wonder why you didn't take it. Okay. Neil, are you hey, back? Back technology. Oh, no worries, Neil. It's okay. Uh, I saw the Moonies. No, quite, I got that. It's quite all right. So uh, when we when we last were uh, together, we were talking about the most addicted people in the system across any yeah. game. Tell us about the lives of the top five people in your social loop, compulsion loop. What is their compulsion like? What's the most activity you've seen from a player in a day? Um, you know, to be honest with you, we haven't, we haven't, and we don't really drill down on uh, individual players uh, that much. And um, you know, we sort of try to look at the user base, um, you know, fairly holistically, um, and actually think about the users based on the number of friends that they have, and you know, the type of behavior that happens with different, you know, different friend levels. I can tell you, at the very high end, you know, there are there are users that play the game for you know eight, ten hours. Um, a day, they're um, they're playing them in fairly long, um, playing the game in fairly long uh, sessions uh, throughout throughout the day, and they're spending, you know, in some cases thousands of, of dollars, um, in, in some cases tens of thousands of dollars um, on uh, on the currency inside the inside the software, which is you know which is Mojo, you know that's a, a very very small set of the audience, and you know the danger when you you know, drill down too much on those, you know, super high-end users is it ends up, you know, really distorting, um, you know, distorting your view of the, uh, of, of, of the world and uh, of, of customers. So, you know, we tend to kind of look at, 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 at holistically and, you know, if you are a, if you're a user with no friends, uh, you are coming back to this uh, game three or four times a day. If you're a user with 11 friends, which is actually the average inside the game, uh, you're coming back seven or eight times um, a day, and the average game session is about seven minutes. Um, and if you have um, 20 or more friends, uh, you're coming back to the game on average uh, 16 times a day. So, you know, if you if you think about what it takes to do kind of like 16 interactions with the software over the course of the day. Um, and you think about the average duration, you know, there's just a lot of minutes being consumed in the, uh, in, in the software. Okay, so you brought up the mojo, you brought up how you make money. Yeah. This is a freemium model. Anybody can play the game free. And in the game, you're building things, you're building up your kingdom, you're leveling up. If you want to go faster, you can buy something called mojo. I'm going to show it here on the screen. Mojo is basically a potion. It's a liquid uh, that if you buy, uh, and here is the store. Let me see if I can zoom in. I guess I can't zoom in, but uh, when I click, maybe I can. Let's see, Mojo store. Okay. Anyway, you can buy uh, 75 Mojo for 10 bucks. You can buy 300 Mojo for 30 bucks, and you can buy the 800 Vintage Mojo for 50 bucks. And these things allow you to build your prison or your dragon's lair or anything that any of those nerdy things that much faster and level up that much faster. Um, you said, and I was kind of in disbelief when you said it, and so was the chat room, there were people who have spent eight or ten hours a day playing the game, which yeah. that, that'll, that does not seem insane because people have played Call of Duty for eight to ten hours. I know over the Thanksgiving or Christmas holiday with one of my nephews, I played it for ten hours in, in a weekend. But people have spent thousands to over $10,000 on Mojo we, yeah. he we heard you correctly. Yeah, you heard me correctly. And, you know, those people are, it's a very small, you know, set of, uh, of, of people. And I guess that, uh, you know, for, for, for them, uh, you know, they think about money in a, in a, in a different way. Um, do you feel guilty taking $10,000 for somebody for a virtual drink called Mojo? I mean, no. 
Not at all. I mean, I, you know, we didn't force them to uh, to spend the money. We, you know, the minimum increment you can buy is, or the maximum increment you can buy is fifty dollars, right? So, wow. Uh, you, you you have to really want to, uh, you know, uh, to consume, you know, the content that the game has to offer. Um, if you are willing to hit that fifty dollars that number of times, you'd have to be truly addicted, which people do. And like you're saying, I mean. You, you have to buy it in $50 increments, so if you spend $10,000, you'd have to click buy 200 times. Yeah. I mean, that's an awful lot of commitment. And to even spend it, how quickly could you spend it? I mean, you, I guess you could spend it in a couple of minutes. Um, but spend but it. it. Yeah. You, 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 can, you can spend it, you, you know, you can spend it pretty, uh, pretty quickly if you set your mind to it. And, uh, you know, you've got to bear in mind that we released the game here. You know, the game has been out now for... Uh, we released it in February in Canada, which is the sort of we use Canada as a as a test market, and um, you know a lot of the you know the big spending behavior um, had you know was driven from those you know those early customers, and they're clearly you know clearly very affluent. Um, you know they are from all over the world, and uh, you know obviously have access to you know to to, to money now. I wish the average customer would spend that much money in the game, but that's not the case. And, you know, we tend to, you know, monetize between sort of one and two percent of the audience on a daily basis through virtual good sales. And then, you know, 98 percent of the audience, um, you know, don't pay us money each day. And we monetize those, you know, those folks through, you know, advertising and uh, this install offers that you'll see from you know, from, from time to time. And they also create a really vibrant community that, you know, helps keep word of mouth about the software go going and, you know, um, you know allows, allows new paying customers to, to come into the fray. What's the future of this? Because it's so promising. People are so addicted. Uh, it reminds me of the early days of video games or the early days of World of Warcraft, whatever, where you have so much energy, this new computing device, the iPad, which... I got to get your thoughts on how that changed the business. So that's one question. But putting that aside, uh, you know, what impact the iPad had on We Rule and these games? Because it must have been tremendous to have a big screen like this and to carry it everywhere with you. But w where is this all going? Is is this going to end with, um, you know, some weird William Gibson science fiction where people are spending more time in the game than out of it? Is it going to end with you doing a We Rule movie? Is this going to be a television series? How, how do you? Because these brands are becoming very uh, known and very people are very loyal to them. In fact, you must have seen Farmville being promoted by, was it 7-Eleven or something I heard on the radio today? They're go to 7-Eleven and get a yep. thing, a button or a card to unlock a, a, a swimming pool in Farmville. So now Farmville is selling coffee. I mean, how big is this space going to get and what's next on a creative basis, Neil Young? Um, you know, my sense is it's, it's, a, I mean, it's a huge uh, marketplace. I mean, we, when we started the company, you know, it was entirely conceivable to us that sort of five years from the outset, there would be half a billion to a billion people walking around uh, the planet with devices, you know, like the iPhone in their, uh, in their pockets. And, you know, at that time, candidly, we didn't, you know, foresee... Uh, tablet computing or, you know, if you see what, uh, you know, Google has been talking about with apps that are running in multiple venues from phones to tablets to, you know, to, to televisions, the same application. I think that sort of app economy and, uh, you know, and, and, and gaming sort of uh, is going to be um, a huge business and a huge opportunity for everybody. Uh, in, involved in it, so I mean, ultimately, tremendous potential creatively. Where is it, where where is it going? I mean, we're just really at the very outset. Um, you know, you have yet to see, I think, you know, great, you know, what I'll call traditional video games. You know, things um, that you might expect to see uh, on a console or a PC, uh, combined with some of these sort of um, really new ways of connecting with players uh, and connecting players to one another. And then also monetizing those games. I mean, you know, a game like uh, Call of Duty, you know, which sells 10 million copies in a you know in a year, 15 million copies in a year, at uh, 60 dollars um, a copy. Imagine if that was available to everybody uh, and was free to play. You know, the reach of these brands would be pretty uh, pretty spectacular. 
Um, now, does does it end up in uh, you know kind of a you know a cyberpunk esque you know William Gibson type uh, world where we you know where we live in video games? Uh, probably not. Um, but video games have a lot of legs and, and, and life left in them. And I think as we move from you know multiple devices running the same applications that are essentially you know sort of living in the cloud and being browsed on different devices. You know your kingdom on We Rule. You can see that same kingdom on the iPhone uh, with a slightly different, um, you know, slightly different layout and, uh, and format. There's really no reason why uh, the game can't exist in many, many other uh, venues. So wherever you have free entertainment time um, in, in whatever venue you're in, the game is is able to, you know, to serve you. So I think that's, you know, you're going to see us explore that path as an industry um, and then move into sort of. You know, cloud gaming, where you know the game is not just the logic is not just living in the cloud, but actually the visualization, the rendering um, is all living in the cloud. And you're going to get some really high-end uh, gaming experiences on devices that you know are only powerful enough to uh, take the image that's being sent down to them and then send back uh, control data to the server, so the server can render the next frame and then send it back again. So when you bring up that situation of the rendering and it's coming from the cloud, clearly you're referring to television? No, more, um, you know, if you're familiar with uh, some of the stuff that's happening in the traditional game space right now with companies like OnLive and sure. Gaikai. Sure, sure. So, you know, so the way that works is um, a game that was originally written for the PC is actually running in the cloud. Um, the graphic output is being compressed in real time. That's being sent down to, um, to the client, which is essentially a dumb terminal that then decompresses that video image, takes the control inputs, sends the control inputs back up the pipe so that on the other end, the next frame could be rendered. So you're pushing compute power from you know, the local client um, into, the, uh, into the cloud, and you can get just tremendous um, you know, sort of uh, levels of visual fidelity running on devices that, you know, don't have the native processing power to be able to, uh, to, to consume them. Uh, you mentioned uh, the iPhone application. I know when I discovered the iPhone application was available, uh, when I went to the beach one day, I was able to, um, you know, basically get my crops, my, my, my magic cauliflower. Uh, that I'm so addicted to because it takes, that's the longest, I think it's 12 hours or maybe it's 24 hours or some other things to, to plant. So clearly working on multiple devices is going to be a big part of this. Um, Male-female ratio on these, it's, it feels like every one of my sister-in-laws or aunts is involved in Farmville or We Rule. Does this skew more female? It does, much more than, than uh, many of our other games. I mean, this game is, you know, sort of 55% male, 45% um, female. It's also um, an older audience than you know you would typically see in a game, especially on the free store. You know, if you think about the number of uh, devices that Apple has sold, sort of iPhone OS devices, let's say, you know, let's say it's 90 million. You know, um, there's probably about 70 million, maybe 75 million of those that are active, um, and it skews you know uh, a little more towards the iPhone than the iPod Touch, but the iPod Touch. Is a huge part of the of the audience, and the iPod Touch is sort of dominated, you know, by uh, under sixteen year olds, um, who you know don't have a lot of available uh, income, so they download free applications. So if you're launching a, f a free application, you're very likely to get kind of a, a mix of sixty percent iPod Touch, forty percent um, iPhone, and you know, w in the case of We Rule, uh, that's inverted, and uh, you know, and then some. So. You know, I think part of the success of We Rule has to do with you know two things from a um, from a sort of uh, growth and appeal standpoint. It's got um, a, a good balance of, of men and women, uh, and from a monetization standpoint, it's skewed more towards uh, the iPhone customer and uh, you know who's who's typically you know got more disposable income than a you know iPod Touch user. Okay, so. Please tell me uh, that the rumors are true that we're going to be able to attack each other's kingdoms at some point. This must be coming. Don't know. Yeah, oh. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, um, we talk about that, but you know, when you think through the 
um, when you think through the ramifications of uh, PVP, you know, player versus player, instead of P plus P, um, you can start creating, um, you know, uh, a sort of a death spiral uh, in terms of social obligation and social expression. And so, you know, we don't actually have a really good answer creatively of how to do that yet. And so we think about it and we talk about it, but um, it's not the next thing that's coming for sure. Uh fascinating, uh, the addiction levels and where this is going. I, I got to think that these become console games at some point. And um, ha have you, ha I mean, you come from electronics arts as a background. Where are you guys at in terms of thinking about the console? Um, I, I think the traditional console business is uh, a disaster right now, honestly. It's, um, you know, you've got development budgets that are you know, to create a competitive title on the PlayStation 3 or the Xbox 360, you need to be spending 30, 50 million um, dollars to build each one of those games. Um, and you're seeing uh, sort of ever increasing uh, pressure to, you know, only top titles performing in the marketplace and the second tier titles, you know, that don't, you know, get into the top 10 for the year um, are losing money. And uh, so, you know, my sense is that business is uh, going to go through and actually is going through right now um, a really big, uh, really big change. And I think it's coming, you know, at the hands of devices like, you know, the iPhone and the iPod Touch certainly, you know, starting to um, really damage and eat into, you know, and destroy things like the Sony PSP or the Nintendo DS. Um, and I think you'll see devices like, you know, the iPad uh, begin to change uh, users' patterns uh, in the home, you know, which is actually where we see predominantly iPad usage happening is sort of with customers, um, in a, you know, in the home in a static location uh, versus, you know, versus on the go. So I think that's starting to eat into kind of living room gaming and bedroom gaming. And if you think about sort of TVs, you know, what... Uh, you know, Android is talking about and showing now with Sony and LG and Samsung with, you know, um, Android enabled uh, televisions that can run the same applications that live on the tablet and on the phone. You know, my expectation is that those devices are, you know, those, those apps are going to satisfy a really broad audience of people and probably provide most of their gaming uh, needs without the need to have a traditional uh, gaming console. And on the other side, um, Things like OnLive and Gaikai are really changing how high-end video games can kind of get delivered. And so, you know, my thought in general for NG Moco is, you know, focus on being the very, very best uh, mobile gaming company in the world. Uh, try to learn faster than anyone else. Try to build the best things you possibly know how to build. Uh, try to get as much knowledge as we possibly can and focus, you know, on mobile and then through apps find our way into, into different venues. Uh, continued success with the company. Uh, it's pretty inspiring to see the, the uptick in these things. I have no idea exactly where this is going, but I get the sense that you, you figured out how to not have people drop off because if anybody was going to drop off, it'd be someone like me who's super busy and I haven't yet to drop, I have yet to drop off and you just got me hooked again into the compulsion loop by letting me expand my realm because I was like, ah, I got no more space left. This is taking too long. And you're like, oh, here's another realm. You can now click over here and go to another, you know, basically another wing of your of your of your kingdom. Uh, so continued success with that. We're going to be watching. Uh, and uh, what what kind of developers are you looking for? We'll give a little quick plug for. I'm sure you're hiring like crazy. We are. We are. You know, if you are a great iPhone uh, engineer, uh, if you are um, a great uh, Rails engineer, if you are a, a DBA. Uh, if you are a tech ops person, uh, please uh, you know contact us at, at jobs at ngmoco.com uh, or go to um, the jobs page, which you can you can get to from ngmoco.com uh, and check out the available positions. I mean, our, our basic thought is yes, we want people who you know have relevant domain expertise, and yes, we want people who share our vision. Um, but this market is changing and, and growing so fast. You know, we try to hire, you know, really smart people, you know, people who are capable of learning new things quickly um, and people who are willing to learn new things quickly and try to offer them, you know, the opportunity to kind of grow with, uh, you know, uh, with, with the company. And, um, and so, 
if you're out there and that sounds like you, um, please look us up. And uh, I heard you mention Rails there. And sometimes I know when I try to log into WeRule, it's gotten a little bit better of late. There's been some problems. Is that Rails scaling issues that you're experiencing, or is it server experiences? What's, what's, what's causing the uh, server hiccups? Is it just growth? Uh, yeah, it's, it's growth. Hopefully we have, uh, you know, we rule pretty much uh, under control now. You know, we, um, uh, we released Godfinger, which is another free game. It's sitting number 10, number 11 in the free charts um, right now and adding a lot of users each day. And so each of these games have, you know, their own unique server infrastructure and then run um, on top of our plus network, which is serving literally millions of daily active uniques each day. And, you know, the, you know, the big, um, you know, growth that we saw on WeRule actually um, precipitated us having to, you know, not just buy new infrastructure, you know, not just buy new hardware, uh, but make some pretty meaningful changes to the way in which the uh, the infrastructure scaled, both you know both from a software standpoint and then a physical standpoint. We had to spin up a you know another data center with more power and more space than we had you know than we uh, had originally uh, originally planned for. So you know one element is Rails of, of these games. Cassandra is uh, is another piece of the puzzle, which is a uh, you know a, a different type of uh, you know database that we use for use the data in, uh, in Godfinger and, uh, and eliminate. So, you know, we're starting to, you know, when you do sort of tens of millions of sessions of, you know, gameplay every day and, you know, we serve well over 30, mil 30 million yeah. minutes of uh, game every day um, here at NGMoco. When you're, you know, when you're doing that, um, you just encounter some unique, you know, unique challenges. And I know that doesn't, um, that doesn't make it good if you're a customer and you want to go and harvest your crops and you can't because uh, the infrastructure is down. But um, you know the team here has worked around the clock on many, many, many occasions to try to make sure that the infrastructure is is good and, and will continue to scale with the business. Heard you mention Cassandra. How's that working out for you? We're using it at Mahalo as well. I know Dig and Twitter are all using it. And uh, there's a great new startup called Riptano that is uh, doing scalability in Cassandra that I've been talking to. Uh, yeah, use Riptano. Oh, uh, you use Riptano. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, it's it's Jonathan Ellis. I think is yeah. the name of the guy who's the lead developer on uh, one of the lead developers on Cassandra. And um, you know we are um, scaling that system out. We use it for uh, uh, for user data um, on uh, on Godfinger and on Eliminate and. You know, every time you what we call user data in those in those scenarios is sort of the design of your planet in Godfinger. You know, that's all held uh, in Cassandra, and uh, you know we just you know we were trying to hold that in uh, uh, in uh, MySQL, and uh, just turns out that was a dumb idea. And so we uh, uh, yeah, uh, and so we moved over to Cassandra as quickly as we possibly could, and it's uh, it's it's just working great. I mean, really is working great. Yeah, it is amazing how Cassandra, a year ago, nobody's using it in sort of practicality or any major installation. And all of a sudden, this non-SQL database is now the standard. And everybody's yeah, using it. Uh, I've never data seen a scale. technology be adopted so quickly. I think data scale, you know, for us, you know, when, you know, when we're writing, you know, a few K of information back and, you know, back and forth, it's not a big deal. But when you're stamping out, you know, 100 to 200 k of data. Um, you know, you really, you know, you really need uh, something that has that type of throughput. So, um, it is, uh, uh, it is doing, uh, doing a great job for us. You know, right now, and you know, we'll see how that scales as you know as as we continue to scale the business. Awesome. Uh, well, if you're a Cassandra developer or an iPhone developer or a Ruby developer, if you are a developer who doesn't know any of these things but wants to learn and be part of a really cool culture at a great company, you need to email Neil at jobs at ngmoco. Thanks for coming on the program and continued success. And let me Thanks. kill something in We Rule as soon as possible. All right. We'll get working on that right now. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks a lot, Neil. Talk thanks. to you soon. Uh, wow, what a great guest. What a great... Uh, what a great story. Right. I, the interesting question there was, does he feel guilty about taking the money? I'm more concerned as a game developer, might be concerned with people spending eight hours a day on something that might not be considered that productive. Do you have it? Is there any sort of 
I know that's interesting. But bring I'm, Lon in here for the news, by the way, because Lon is addicted to this game too. He could probably have something to say. La, da, da. All right, we got Lon in here, looking good. Uh, so your question yeah. is, God, there's one thing to take whoever the schmuck is spending $10,000 right. to take their money. Right. You know what? That's the same schmuck who would order $10,000 in pay-per-view or would buy $10,000 in comic books or but the, if, if this can $10,000 in DVDs they're never going to watch. There's some really no val offense, valuable... <laughs> um, I do. I have a lot of, lot of DVDs. There's a, certainly a lot of value in figuring out how to get people disengaged in something, but if that could be applied to education or some other well, vehicle... I, yeah, I mean, that is the... Yeah, that, that's the rub with all this. You have this compulsion loop, you have the social obligation, you have the reciprocation effect. These guys have it down to a science yeah. in order to get 1% of the people wasting their lives in these games <laughs> to give them money for virtual goods. Right. And everybody who looks at the space says, can we get these people to cure cancer? Right. <laughs> or yeah. something, or, to, or when that guy got lost, um, the pilot, can we show them a bunch of you know, images from Google Maps, have them have some compulsion loop about saying there's nobody here, there's no crash plane. The game, right. So that right. we can, the game becomes find the guy whose plane crashed. It's actually interesting, there's a Philip K. Dick book called Time Out of Joint about that very thing, where it's a guy and he thinks he's just playing this silly little game in the newspaper every yeah. day, and then it turns out he's actually uh, plotting strategy for an interstellar war he doesn't even know is going on. Well, thanks for ruining the film and the book for everybody, Lon. <laughs> very good. Ender's Game. But it's the, it's the, <laughs> same, it's the same guy to set up that he's being tricked into playing a game that's actually got massive, important work. Right. Under, under, underlying it. And so all of these novels and all of these stories are basically a way for nerds who are wasting their lives to justify it yes. in some way. I feel better. No offense, better. Derek. But there's also, it's uh, also <laughs> in, so, at the control booth in so much as it's not being used for education, actually has a, an, currently a sort of detrimental effect to education because relatively, the kids perceive education as so boring relative to the game. Right. So it's causing them to be less engaged as, I, I guess as the years you, go yes, on. You could, say, but you could say that playing Farmville or Call of Duty. And so my solution to this is, I have an actual solution to this uh, as the chairman of the internet. I think that Call of Duty should be uh, raised to $300 per copy. So only one out of five people buys it. Then the rest of the people who buy it should have to take a history lesson to play the next level. So. You want to go fight in World War II, you've got to answer 10 questions about history around that. You want to get to the next level, you've got to learn about this general, this war, and these issues. Basically, we, we, treat, we could train people in history. And then, if you want to go on a mission to this country, you have to name it. And you have to name the type of, is it a democracy, is it a, is it a dictatorship, and how many people live there, and all these things that a real educated person should know. They should build education into the games in order to level up and get the products and stuff in them. What do you think, Lon? I mean, I think that's an interesting idea. We actually uh, we played educational game apps for the iPad last week. Those are the apps we reviewed, yeah. and uh, that it is something I noticed that the games that are just for fun are way more sophisticated than the games that are trying to teach you something or get you something out of it. I, I don't know if it's that they bring in educators to work on those games and those people just don't have the same kind of knowledge of compulsion loops and, and game dynamics that somebody like Neil has, who's obviously spent years and years studying this. Um, interestingly, he also worked on a lot of those Maxis games, which are a little bit, I mean, stuff like The Sims, Spore, SimCity, there's a little bit more going on there than Call of Duty, which All right, is just All right, so uh, Tyler's complaining about it. Uh, with, it's not a complaint. I think no, it's, an it's a good observation, well, and it's an opportunity. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah. So I want somebody right now who has got uh, the ability to program something on the iPad. I want to make a geography game, Jason's Geography, whatever we're going to call it. <laughs> and I want people to know countries, like, people like Sarah Palin, you know, like people who know nothing. The Jason Nations. That's what it should be Jason called. Jason Nations. I want somebody to make a Jason Nation iPad application where it shows you the world. You, Because I would also like this, because I don't know every country cold. I don't know every capital. And you just boom, boom, boom. You go through the game. You score. And it keeps other people's scores. And you have to learn facts. And how many facts deep can you go? And it's got a clock. So the, the top 20 facts about the country, who the president is, who the last president was, when it was founded, is it a democracy, the population, currency, all the things that would make the world smarter, I want to get that application going. Somebody build it. I'll back it. I think one thing I'd, I'd mention, though, is 
conventional video games, stuff like Call of Duty that you play on a console, it's a massive time suck, or World of Warcraft. I mean, that's maybe the biggest time suck of any game yeah. ever. These kinds of games, though, that we rule on, you play them in the background. It's 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Yeah, that's the nefarious part. I don't, but I don't really see it as being as overwhelming and sucking up all your time as if you get into, like, an MMORPG, where it's obviously, like, going to be... Told it's, days it basically your becomes your job. Right. Whereas a game like this, it's almost, you can be more productive. I mean, I can check in on We Rule, not that I ever would do this, but I could theoretically check in on We Rule while at work for 10 minutes and then go back to whatever I was doing. I, I, well, I go outside to take a break. I always check on my iPhone, my We Rule Kingdom, and I accept I, some orders. I, I Everybody do. does I will. I will harvest my cauliflower now and again. I, I wish they would come out with another magic vegetable that was 48 hours so I could just stay off the thing for 48 hours, yeah. but they're not going to do that. No, they want you to check in, yeah. Uh, obviously, it's really cool that people have figured out this compulsion loop social object stuff. Be nice if we could put some of these things to good use, uh, aside from gambling and because there are, there are a lot of things that you can learn just by sort of doing repetition, and those things are perfect for games. It seems natural. It's a natural. There was somebody at TechCrunch 50, I can't remember, who was doing SAT prep. You remember we, the SAT prep company mm -hmm. where you played the right. SAT game alongside other people yeah, and you were in a chat that. room? I forgot the name of it. Somebody in the chat room will tell us. Who was at TechCrunch 50 last year who did that? I can't remember. If you're in the chat room and you'd like to come to the TechCrunch conference, TechCrunch 50 conference free, which is now known as the Launch Conference, uh, thelaunchconference.com. If you say, I can't wait for the launchconference.com in your Twitter account right now, uh, Roberta will put you in the spreadsheet if you do it 10 times. The first 100 people to do it 10 times are going to get 10 times while watching an episode live. Right, yes. You have to They're going to get free it. tickets to the event. The tickets are probably going to cost. Put pound twist on it, too. Put pound twist on pound it so twist you can so find, find it. Find da, da, da. Uh, okay, let's do the news. All right, so. Um, I have no other advertisers, right? Just Drobo did a great job. Drobo, we want to thank this week. We're, we're actually stream, going to, in the next couple weeks, there will be some advertisers that are coming on board the yeah. Tuesday Drobo show. Drobo was a cross promotion thing. They gave us the Drobo, for free. We're, we we're, we're saying nice stuff about them because it's a great news, product. There's three and new ad slots on the Tuesday show. So there the are, but they're filling up fast. Oh, okay. So Friday show, we'll still have DNA Mail, Web Spy, and Power VPS. That's the yes. Friday advertisers. Tuesday, in. we have, uh, I know, Trada. Trada, T-R-A-D-A. They Trada. are coming on board, I believe, next week. Yeah, Trada is going to be on. And then I think we also have... You want to announce the other one? I didn't know if it was... Yes. We're announcing it in, in two weeks, but we can talk about it now. I think I Yex is going to be a sponsor Yex, at some that's point. The they, one, they, yes. had, they had shown interest. I don't know what the status of it and, is. Oh, uh, but that means there's one slot open. Right. That's that's basically it. There's so five or six slots are taken. There's one slot open. It's $3,000 a week. And we've already had some interest out there. I mean, if people want to get in on it, they should act now. Basically making my show the most profitable show on the This Weekend Network. Well, yeah. I mean, that's Five. why we've had to double up. Yeah. The that's first show we've had to double up because there's twice no a week. more slots. So basically, there. my show is so successful, I have to do this twice a week. That's, that's it. And because there's so many good people to interview. And the people demand it. And somebody asked about uh, Bing and their sponsorship. Uh, they've been a sponsor. They're going to be a sponsor again. I don't know when they're going to start it, but they have to coordinate it with the activities they have going on. So right. they have like a marketing campaign. And they actually I have, am sure uh, they're going to be back on. They, they have some some specific projects. I, I'm not hey, somebody's like 3K a week. But... Ouch. You realize the value? I'm giving a live ad here, and the original people were paying a 1000 so they're getting a pretty good deal. Um, yeah, Tyler and Lon get tons of credit for being on the show. They just don't get any money. No. Okay. Well, Part owner of this. You're weekend. a part owner. I, Look at all. I get it. Owner. I get it. Beakwet. Got his beakwet. Finally, got his beakwet. Speaking of beakwet, beakwet. Uh, 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 the guys from um, uh, Enrolled In are going to come in this week, I think, for a meeting. Oh yes, loved Enrolled In. They're going to come in I this get, week. I Nineteen year old kid. Ever since we new business about partner. That on the air, we, I'm getting a lot of emails, so I can be very selective about who we get on for Ask Jason and Shark Tank. I've got. Five times more people trying to get on than we can. Now that they get. know that two out of the last three have resulted in an investment. Yes, it's true. My hair is crazy. They're Lon, it's just time for a little gel, a little cleanup, Stop shave a little it up. Haircut, you, you got yeah. the nice shirts now. You're buying the expensive shirts. Yeah. You got that. Did the new car come today or yesterday? No, no. I, I'm I'm waiting another week or so because I, I want to leave a bigger down payment, so I have a few right. smaller a little, monthly, little extra cheddar. Smaller monthly, so I'm going to wait. You for didn't a ask Jason for a little extra cheddar. I would have I would have spotted you. Uh, that's what I'm doing right now on the air. That's I would have, I would have given you, you a pinch. I would have given you a pinch. That's the place to eat you up. I've learned. I always loan my friends money. It happens all the time. Um, I think it's something if you a nice thing you can do if you have the ability. That is that's a nice gesture. Uh, it's a nice gesture. You know what the interesting thing is? The people who are the good people they never ask you for like Tyler was in a massive cash crunch. He never asked me. And then the people who I can't stand are like, hey, can you loan me money? And I'm like, I don't even know you. You're a knucklehead. 
Anyway, uh, let's go anyway. to the news. Let's do three, three or four news stories, and we're out of here. I've got, I've got five total, so you can cut me off whenever you like. Right. Uh, the first one I guess we should talk about, uh, it's big news in our very space, TechCrunch TV. Yes. Yesterday saw the launch of TechCrunch TV, a new streaming video network from the popular technology blog. Right now it's featuring 40 minutes of live programming a day focused on tech topics. Mm. Obviously that's going to expand uh, more over time. And, you know, they rerun other stuff and everything's on demand so you can go and see it whenever you want. Uh, the show's run on a stream. There's a featured loop. Uh, so there are live shows, but then you can go watch whatever other programming you want. Uh, and it's going to also highlight other videos that they've made in the past for TechCrunch. Uh, the network launched with two shows, Keen On, starring Andrew Keen. Uh, I know you guys are yeah, friends. Friend of mine. Uh, he's been here to Mahalo to speak. Uh, and TechCrunch Now, which is reporter Evelyn Rusley and the site's bloggers discussing sort of news of the day. They're also going to launch Speaking Of with Cyan Bannister later this week. So uh, did you get to check out any of the shows? What do you think? I mean, how, how are they doing? And do you think this is going to be like a direct, a real direct competitor for us at this weekend? No, I mean, it's tech. Uh, and you can tell me more as a creative director this weekend if you think it is. But um, he's got a good guy, Paul Carr, running it. Mm -hmm. I don't think Paul is like the ultimate on-air personality in the way Leo Laporte is in the tech space. He's not like a professional guy right. in that way, uh, on-air guy. Um, Andrew Keen is uh, a very smart guy, but I think he's a little grating, so I'm not going to watch that show every week. I, I'm sure I'll be on, and I'm sure I'll watch it sometimes. Uh, where they're going to shine, is it going to do, when somebody's in there to do an interview for the publication, they're going to get to jump in there and do a yeah. quick interview about the thing, just like I did a quick interview with NG uh, Moco. Uh, so, slightly competitive with my show and I guess Leo Laporte's, but there's plenty of room for everybody. So, um, this weekend, from what I understand, is a little bit more lifestyle and video games, cars, yeah. we're, we're comedy, into TV, movies, music, topics. all that stuff. So, yeah, I'm not worried about it. And I think it's, uh, I think Mike is going to sell TechCrunch uh, in the next year. And I think moving into San Francisco, boxing me out as a partner on the TechCrunch 50 conference, and now launching TechCrunch TV and him moving up to Seattle are all uh, the signs that he's trying to create a lot of value and disconnect himself from the brand. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be on the shows as much, right? I think it's going to be no, other he's people. No, he's actually, he's, uh, he's, my job here is his job there, creative director. Uh, Paul Cars or Mike Arrington's? Mike Arrington. Mike right. Arrington's So Mike Arrington is basically... Paul Carr's running the, the, the yeah. network. So it's pretty clear what Mike's doing. He's distancing, distancing him. He's tired of TechCrunch. He's distancing, distancing himself from the brand in order to take the Martha Stewart effect out of the brand so that he can sell it for 30 or $40 million. Mm -hmm. They probably make, I'm going to take a guess here, I don't know the exact number, uh, five, six, seven million a year in revenue, uh, which means they get five times that for the sale of the company, which means they can easily sell the company for 20, 30, or $40 million in the next year. Congratulations to Mike, who probably owns 60% of the company, 70% of the company. I hope he hits the home run. He's a friend of mine, even though he screwed me by boxing me out of the TechCrunch 50 conference, mm -hmm. which is not going to wind up being screw me ultimately because I've got, I'm the largest shareholder in this weekend. Yeah. Not by a long shot, but a little bit. Uh, and then I also own 100% of the launch conference. So uh, no hard feelings. It's just business. And uh, he's still sort of my friend, I guess. It's kind of hard to have a friendship with somebody who boxed you out like that. But it's just business. It's not personal. I would never do it, but... <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to do? He is my friend. I still consider him my friend and I'm still rooting for him. It's a very weird situation. It it's, it's like when two people crazy. break up who actually really enjoy being with each other, but they just, they can't be with each other for whatever reason. Right. You know, distance or whatever. We still love each other deeply. We still would be together. It's getting really strange. Oh, it's, yeah, I'm a little <laughs> creeped out now. A little creepy, but uh, anyway, I wish Paul, uh, Paul Carr is my friend. I wish him a lot of luck. M.G. Siegler is very talented. I think he's going to be awesome on the show. Eric Schoenfeld in New York, very talented. I'm not sure about the pretty face on it. And who's Evelyn the, uh, Rusley? Uh, she's pro Rusley, I, I, Rusley? Yeah, she's on right now. I don't think that she knows that much about what she's talking about. Like, I don't think she that was, she, she was a writer for Forbes. That's where they, they got Forbes. Being a writer for Forbes isn't saying much. Um, so I don't think that she's like all that. I think she'll just be like a pretty face um, and doesn't have that much substance, which I think is a mistake. I would not have brought her on. Not that I have anything bad to say about her, but I don't think that she's of the caliber of an M.G. Sigler uh, or Eric Schoenfeld uh, or Mike Arrington. What's that? He's telling me I'm sitting poorly. Oh, okay. Audio. No problem, Dar. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I think that's a weird sort of putting her in there when she doesn't have that sort of total substance compared to the other guys. I would just yeah. have the other guys there. And I also think it's kind of insulting. Like It's like, oh, he's a pretty girl. Let's put her out in the front and then have all these ugly guys come in. <laughs> right. It's, it's like a weird thing. It. Yeah. I always find that weird when they well, do that. Like, it's yeah. sort of insulting on a business show, and they're like, like CNBC does it a lot too. They're like, yes. here's like a super pretty attractive girl and a bunch of really ugly guys. It's like, it's obvious what's happening. There's, there are 
women journalists who are much more intelligent than her and have much more to say, who didn't get the slot because they're not as good looking, but like the fat, ugly guys get to be on the show. Yeah, this is based this on is, the things. This so. is something we've struggled with too as a network. Is you know you want to have a good balance. You want to put people on that people want to watch, and at the same time you you don't want to put somebody out there who's just there to you know. And I'm not saying this about her because I really haven't seen very much yeah. with her. But uh, you, yeah, it's always a tough balance to it's strike. It's weird. It's like you're putting a super physically attractive versus substantive. The girl looks like a model, so you're putting a model next to Mike Arrington. It's like it's, it's like putting Shrek yeah. next to you know I don't know. Who's a supermodel? I don't know what's, who's a supermodel these days. It's like putting Megan Fox next to Shrek, you know? Yeah. It's like it's, or <laughs> right. it's like Penn Jillette next to, is it Penn? Is the big Penn guy? Gillette. It's they, like the, Penn yeah. Jillette next to Megan Fox. It's like, you know, yeah. obvious what's going on. So anyway, I find, I find that one dimensional is, kind of insulting to women. Uh, like it's a massive double standard. Dudes are allowed to be on camera. But. That's my point. An unattractive guy like myself, or you, or Tyler, or Mike Arrington, or Eric, or MG. But Tyler's a good looking guy, but the rest of us, Basically, MG's actually a good-looking guy, too, here on the show. I'm watching him. He's got that shaved head and the good glasses. Um, I think this is my, my prediction. MG is going to be the star of this. Very nice. Anyway, there you go. Next story. Uh, next story, let's talk about Hulu. Uh, a post went up today on the Hulu blog by CEO Jason... Kilar, I think, K Kylar, Kilar, mm -hmm. introducing the new Hulu Plus service. Uh, it's not a replacement for Hulu. It's a new ad-supported subscription service. Uh, full seasons of pretty much every show that's currently featured on Hulu. So Modern Family, Glee, 30 Rock, Saturday Night Live, Parks and Recreation, and archive shows as well. Arrested Development, Law & Order, SVU, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and that stuff. Uh, it'll be available on Samsung Internet TVs, gaming consoles like the Xbox and the PS3, Blu-ray players, and they're talking about other hardware options to get it on your TV as well. Uh, there's also going to be, and this is pretty Pretty impressive, I thought. A new Hulu Plus app for iPhone and iPad. You'll be able to stream HD shows over Wi-Fi or 3G connections. The mm. uh, package costs $9.99 a month, and they're currently uh, invitations are currently available for the beta. So if you go to Hulu.com, you can sign up and see about getting your invitation. Uh, so I know you've long been a fan of the subscription model, generally, like Rhapsody. Yeah. So do you think this uh, this has legs, this concept? And are people going to pay 10 bucks a month for shows, most of which they can see on television for free? Uh, yes, absolutely. There's, gonna be, there's a large number of people who are living at home without a plugged-in landline. They use their cell phone at home. Mm -hmm. that, that was an impossibility just 10 years ago. People said, yeah, you, could, you can't sustain yourself with a mobile phone. You need to have a landline at home. Now, probably, I think most young people do not have a landline at home. I don't have a landline at home. Right. Uh, so the next step would be, oh, my God, you can't have radio. How could you live without radio? Now I would venture to guess that most young people are using an iPad, iPod, or Rhapsody and not listening to radio at all. They don't turn the radio on, perhaps when they're in their car, but when they're in their car, they're going to probably use Pandora, their iPod, sure. or, or um, Rhapsody, whatever it is. The same thing is happening to TV. I see people who are canaries in the coal mine saying, I, don't, I got rid of my satellite TV, which is costing... What does that start at? 60 a month? 50, 60 a month, basically? 40 or 50, yeah. Yeah, and then if you want to get anything that's decent, you're at 60, 70 dollars a month. Yes. I think that there'll be a generation who will subscribe to Hulu and uh, Netflix. That's 25 dollars a month for those two services. Mm -hmm. Between Hulu and Rhapsody, you're covered. There's enough entertainment there. And then once in a while, you could spend, let's say once a month, you spend 10 dollars on iTunes. Now you're at 35 dollars. Yeah. That's as much value and as much TV as you need to watch having a ca having cable or having mm -hmm. uh, something else. And the only exception would be people who are into baseball or into basketball or some live Any event. Event, yeah. But news, obviously, is not providing any value. Nobody cares about that. They can get that online. So therefore, really, sports is the only one. And I know a lot of people are now uh, have iPhone applications. I don't know if there's an iPad one of MLB. Where there they is can, an iPad one. Where they can watch any game. Oh, I'm not. I'm not sure. If you I think it's watch video. The games, but, uh, yeah, no, I think it's video, and I, I'm absolutely certain it's audio for NBA and that. But I think you can watch any game, which means they're going to all be going direct. Uh, and of course, people are saying in the chat room, you can go to Justin TV and watch anything that's streaming. Yeah, well, that's and live right. Sports, not, not legally. Uh, but. Which was incredible, I'll tell you, because I was in a hotel room and I wanted to watch a Knicks game uh, this past year, and mm -hmm. I was like, I can't find the Knicks game, and I searched for the Knicks versus whoever, and it sent me to Justin TV, and it's on streaming. I don't know how Justin TV gets away with this, but it seems like Justin TV is one big. I don't know how they get away with it either, but yeah, it, how, I mean, even I mean, pay per view stuff. You can go like watch UFC events on Justin. How do they? I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to be a tattletale or anything like that while we're here, but if I go to Justin TV right now and I were to type in UFC, I don't know if there's a UFC fight, but like 
they're, they're replaying all this stuff on these channels, and when you type in, if I type in World Cup, right, is the World Cup going on right now? Yes, we're in the semifinals. Right, so if I type in World Cup, I can guarantee you, you will find all the World Cup games streaming on Justin TV. And I guess they shut people down, but I mean, this, this is the same sort of thing where people will put up any link to, people put up any link, uh, any video clip on YouTube, now people will stream anything. Mm-hmm. And they used to put anything on BitTorrent. So all this stuff is coming together at once. Uh, and so there is no choice. Either you make the stuff available for a subscription fee or somebody's going to hack it like Justin TV. Uh, not that Justin TV is doing the hacking, obviously. The no, it's, it, I mean, their system, Justin TV, is, it, I think people are saying this, Jeremy, is exactly like YouTube right now. It's, it's like they get a DMCA, they, yeah. they pull it. I think what they need to do is, Justin TV or these people, is they have to do what YouTube did, which is give tools, and maybe they have already. Um, but uh, give a tool to the World Cup so that they can go on here at any time, and if they see their content, they can just go turn something off themselves. Right. I mean, here, I, I'm pretty sure that this is the live World Cup. Well, actually, uh, in, the, in the chat room, they were, they were correcting us and saying the games are actually over today. Okay, so, but I I still, been, as far as I, I can tell, we're watching the World Cup right now on Justin TV, and I have a feeling that ABC did not sanction this, and there's 14 no, other people sure. watching it. I'm sure they uh, did not. And, and uh, I'm also wondering, who are these people who are taking the time to, sh- cause to stream it? You have to set your computer up to a- export. I mean, this is like a little more complicated, but who are these people who are streaming stuff live? Are they trying the same, to make some... It's the same people that take the new Blu-rays and put them immediately on Pirate Bay, right? It's like Some weird addiction they, to piracy. Agenda. Well, I think it's they're making a point. Like, I should be allowed to do this. It's a stupid point. I mean... <laughs> Fair, fair enough. It really is. I mean, you can turn on ABC and watch it. I, I, mean, I, I and uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't illegal. I used to illegally download movies. I, I sort of stopped because it's so easy to get them now. But if you go on any of those Pirate Bay type services, the, the minute something's out on on disc, it's on there. Yeah, I mean, it's just if it's so easy now to get whatever you want. Kudos to the television industry for getting that, where the music industry took a long time. But now that I've got Rhapsody. Um, for 10 bucks a month, and I think Napster's six bucks a month now, and mm-hmm. Spotify, I know other people might have, even though it's not available in the United States, Tyler, uh, other people might have Spotify and be using it, and it's an incredible service. Yeah. They're, uh, they're making the point in the chat room that I think is a, is a very valid one, which is it's about uh, recognition within the community. If you're the person on Justin TV, everybody knows, is going to have the latest hockey game or World Cup game on, you get known in that circle. You build up authority. Yeah. Hey, let me ask a question since we're trying to get the, uh, I don't know what Groove Shark is. Um, it's like uh, Spotify, but in the US, based in the U.S. Oh, okay. Similar. Uh, similar let me ask the folks in the chat room, because we're trying to get the chat rooms more involved in the shows, and it's uh, always good to get feedback. Rate the guest on a scale of 1 to 10. How interesting was the guest today, Neil Young of NG Moco? And rate my interview overall. How was, was my interview with him? Did I ask good questions, et cetera? Rate it 1 to 10, guest and interview. So G colon I colon? G colon I colon. Give me a G colon for the guest and what his rating is. I uh, see the uh, guest was a 10. Awesome service. I, good. I'd say 10. I mean, we had him on iPad, and I, I think he's a fascinating guy. And yeah. I loved hearing about these. I see 8-8, eight, eight, I see 9-9, 9-9, 9-9. Nine, 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 nine. Okay, good, we did good. Uh, and so what we're doing with the show also, for people who are wondering, we're going to do the show Tuesday and Fridays. That's mainly because there's so many good guests, I want to get them out there. Um, and also because we have a crush of sponsors who want to be involved in the program, and we're going to try to build a network, and uh, I love doing the show. We're not going to do Ask Jason and Shark Tank on this show because we want to do a longer interview. But we are going to do five news stories at the end. So you get your news mm-hmm. twice a week from right. us. Right, and that was, a, that was a big thing. People wanted to see People said more commentary, more interactive, more news. One person thought the guest was a four mm-hmm. and I was a six. Okay, I'll, th- I'll take that. Uh, more outspoken people like David. Uh, people love conflict. They want I'm people who are going to come in. That's why the Friday show, the, the, the Jews I hope special. that the terrible graphic designer, Mixie, I, the I reached horribly out to her angry on, Aaron Wall, on Twitter today to see and if the she would psychotic do it. It was one of the best Calacanis cast episodes. Oh, it was great. Schiz- I mean, we, schizo.com. Is, he's, he's in. He's, he's in. He's in. He's, he's, he's going to be on Friday. That guy. He's locked in. That guy so, is so angry. He's, he's, not, he's not happy with you. We, and yet, a lovely guy. I've been chatting with him on email. Oh, really? Really nice. Really well, nice okay. guy. Well, maybe we'll have a moment. Who knows? Anything is possible, but... Uh, it's uh, if you want to see the horrific designer, just look at the person who was replying I think it's to me all day yesterday. M I I X X Y is her name. I, I reached out to her just now on Twitter uh, to see if she's she going to say no because I said her design is horrible. I, I don't know if she's going to do it. And Aaron Wall, I reached out I to him. I don't know if he's going to do it. She has much of a position to argue. Her position to argue is I'm a bad guy. Well, the, no, I, I I had some just because I I basically echoed some of what Jason was saying last night on Twitter. I went on my account and said I really don't get it. if you if you're not interested if you're a freelancer and you work and you have clients. 
don't don't submit anything. Like we, that's okay. We're not saying every designer out there has to submit. This is for people who you know are trying to get started or just want feedback and you know or have a have a little bit of time to spare and want to try it out. And to me, I compare it to you know when I used to write screenplays on spec. I would just write screenplays for free to just show people. You know, it's it's hard work, but you know you want every, to get your name out. I am going to stop engaging the haters after the show on Friday. That is my promise. I'm going to have a hater-free la- at the first half of this year. All I did was engage haters. It psychologically is becoming a, just a huge cloud over my left shoulder. My life is very bright. Everything's awesome, but there's like this little cloud of annoying haters. <laughs> and once in a while, this like shadow and like some rain hits the side of my, and I got to brush my shoulder off. And <laughs> that was brush my shoulder off because his haters are raining it, and I'm the one supposed to be making it. But anyway, it's like, every, and then it's like everything I do. Oh my God, you lost a hundred thousand dollars to Doyle Brunson in this game. Oh my God, you made us. You you shouldn't. Uh, you got lucky against Daniel Negreanu. Oh my God, you changed the, everything I do now is becoming people are obsessing about. And then I can't help myself. I love to engage, mm-hmm. and I have to stop this because I'm too important of a person now. I'm too big, and that's not being an egomaniac. That's just the reality is the newsletter is too big, the show is too big. It's having a negative impact, I think. I think it's having a negative impact that I engage them. I, I think, uh, you know, it, it eggs them on. People want to respond because they're going to get a response yes. from you and they're going to get attention. Right. And I mean, how many people probably went to... Mixie's Twitter feed that would never have, I was there. Oh, no, and, and what she said was, she's like, and I got a free link back from Jason on my Twitter feed. And I was like, great, enjoy your 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. That'll be the most, it was sort of like the guy who left here and decided he had to post my email to him. I was like, really, that's going to be your 15 most important minutes of your life mm-hmm. is to send the private email, make it public. Like, I have to stop engaging. I have to. And I'm gonna stop after Friday. After but Friday, Friday, but Friday, it is on. So let everybody know, like a Donkey Kong. If you any haters, are a hater, email me because we want to have you on on Friday. All jaders arrive at 1 p.m. and the show will go until the jaders run out. And, and I'm not, I swear I mean, to God, if this takes five hours, every jader mm-hmm. will have their moment. I will hash it out with every jader. I don't. I literally don't care. I will give each one 20 minutes. We'll do three an hour. Yeah. And if there are 15 of them. We'll do a five-hour freaking show of every Jader. Email Jader at thisweekend.com. Email Lon at thisweekend.com. No, somebody it, just said email Jader, J-A-Y-T-E-R <laughs> at thisweekend.com. And no. I think it's, so Roberta no, that's, must that's, have, uh, that's Roberta. If you are a Jader, email Oh, if you are a Jader, yeah. email Lon at thisweekend.com. And, and to qualify, like, people are asking, what, what is a Jader? A Jader is not just someone who, like, I don't like this one thing Jason said. No, it's no, that no, 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 no. I am building a case that Jason Calacanis is a bad guy. Right. If, you're, if you believe that I am a bad guy, that's who we're looking for. And to be totally honest, (laughs) I want to hear from you. (laughs) I want to hear what you have to say. (laughs) I want to know what you're feeling, Jaders. (laughs) Because I care. I think she gives you a pretty good shape. Very close. Very close, yeah. Like Rambo. But that's it. After, enough with the sentimental music. Yeah. After Friday, it's going to be a no hater. Hater free zone. Hater free 2010. I'm, I'm, I'm making myself the promise I will not engage a hater. I will not do it on Hacker News. I will not do it on Twitter. It's going to be peace and love. Peace and love. I am warning you with peace and love. Next story. Next story. Let's talk about. Uh, uh, maybe the biggest story of this week. Earlier this week in a tweet uh, he has since deleted, Dig CEO Kevin Rose said Google was building a direct competitor to Facebook to be called Google Me. Uh, now a former Facebook executive core founder Adam D'Angelo has confirmed the rumors, stating confidently that there are a large number of Googlers working on the project presently, and it's going to be an attempt to expand what the company sort of started with Buzz. Uh, according to D'Angelo, Google realized Buzz is just not enough, and the only way to really take on Facebook is going to be to create their own full-featured facebook inspired Inspired social network. Um, D'Angelo is saying Google had long assumed Facebook's growth would eventually slow and that now they're scared because they're seeing that that does not seem to be happening. So do you think Google is going to be able to chip away at the 500 million people who already have uh, Facebook accounts? And how do you think they should sort of counter position themselves? Uh, they absolutely can compete. Uh, just the same way Facebook will be able to compete in the advertising space and the search space versus Google. Mm-hmm. Facebook search. Apple search, Facebook, 
uh, ad network, Apple ad network. These things are all well underway and being built uh, and will all be released within the next 24 months, is my belief. If Google did a full court press, they have the front page at the end of the day. If they really wanted to take the gloves yep. off. Yeah, that's, they, they, nev they never have done they've that. They've rarely done it. They, they have started to, though. And uh, there were times with Google Wallet they tried and just... So when Google feels that they're really threatened, they will do this. Automatically putting buzz into Gmail was a test. Mm -hmm more aggressive than they probably should have been. Some people got upset about the privacy things, but they quickly corrected them. Um, Buzz is a brilliant product. The more I use Reader and Buzz, the more I realize that the intelligent people are over there, are kind of existing. I see you on uh, the Reader mm -hmm. all the time doing things, CK Sample, Veronica Belmont, Leo Laporte, they're all buzzing and doing uh, Google Reader. And it, it really is a nice little loop. It has to be on its own domain name. I hate having to log into my Gmail account, click Buzz or click Reader. It needs to be its own Google.me, and that's what it should be, Google.me, uh, and it will be tremendously successful. It'll be a huge success. Especially if they um, do everything that everyone complains about, the exporting of data, which you know Google stuff, would do. privacy settings. And the yeah. thing is, th before you, you have to finish the product in order to get the gains. So a product that is 60% done, 70% done, 80% done, and 90% done, will probably perform the same. And that's what's happened with Buzz. Buzz is not finished. Buzz is a brilliant product. It works really well. They have to put it on its own domain. They should buy buzz.com from whoever owns it and make it buzz.com. And it's just a Google brand like Orchid is. And it would, it would be huge if you just log in with your Google thing and it would work brilliantly. They just haven't done it. It's infuriating, but they have to finish that last 25%. Um, so was it that confirmed the D'Angelo? Uh, it is, yeah, it's Cora, the Cora founder. Oh. His name's Adam D'Angelo, uh -huh. former Facebook yeah, yeah, executive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it... yeah. Okay, uh, next story. Next story. Uh, breaking news today, Bloomberg is citing two anonymous sources who say that an iPhone for Verizon Wireless will be available beginning in January. It's been theorized that the leak announcement may have been a tactic by Verizon, who want to encourage people to wait a few more months before they buy their iPhone 4 and renew their AT&T contract for two more years. So obviously this is great news for Verizon, gets his hands on you know this hot phone, uh, and it's bad news for AT&T, which loses their exclusivity. But what do you think this is going to do for Android? I mean, is this going to have any impact that... They've up till now been the dominant Verizon smartphone. This doesn't make any sense for me because didn't they just sign an, an exclusive deal with AT and T for two more years or something, or did they just not announce another deal? Uh, Apple. I, I'm 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 not I'm not 100 percent sure what happened there, but this is saying January 2011 uh, there will be a Verizon iPhone. But this is hmm. not an official announcement. It's certainly not an official announcement. It's just right. a rumor that Bloomberg has published from two anonymous sources. So yeah, I don't know when don't the know exclusive the with Apple iPhone ends for AT&T. If somebody could look that up, but uh, AT&T did announce 2012 as their end date for exclusivity. So maybe this would be... This would be January of 2012. 2012. That's not what the Bloomberg article says. Okay, but. so there's also a possibility that the AT&T contract could have certain terms and conditions in it. Right. Which is, if network performance doesn't get to a certain point in time, uh, they're allowed to give it to somebody else. If that's actually going to be the main weakness in the iPhone ecosystem is the network aspect, which they it, don't control. It's the only aspect. It's it, the only right. weakness at this point. Right. I mean, nobody can fault but the it iPhone for their ability to compete with Android. Yes. Is the net, that's their weak link. It's the only weak link. It also is a massive revenue uh, push there. But I'm sure that there is some sort of out that Steve Jobs put into there based upon performance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the performance not there. And you see Steve Jobs is exacerbated. He was exacerbated at the D conference when he talked about it, and he said basically it has to get better, and here's the reasons, and I got good people telling me it's going to get better, and I believe them, but you know it, it has to, and one, we're on it. The, so he is on that issue. The one thing they could do is, and obviously it wouldn't be above board, but they could effectively, now that the iPhone 4 could work on the T-Mobile network, mm -hmm. if they allowed it, if such a hack were to develop, Right? So uh -huh. this iPhone 4 just got cracked, right? Yeah. Recently. Three days after being out. Right. Who's to say that it's not in Apple's interest that you're able to use it? Obviously, it's in their interest that you can use it on the T-Mobile network. So Apple doesn't stop the jailbreaking anymore? Correct. Well, or Apple only that, releases but, but jailbreaking. Literally has a back channel to get people running I on T-Mobile. I think that the AT&T contract probably has within it that they will, in good faith, Oh, stop no, people no doubt from it, hacking the no, service. No doubt it does. So I think that um, this is completely dependent on AT&T's performance. If AT&T 
keeps up their performance. There's probably not a reason for Apple to do it because they're making such a fortune. And it does not seem to have a negative impact on iPhone sales, which is a testament to the product and the fact that people use this product 98% for things other than talking on the phone. I mean, people do not talk on their iPhones. That's the bottom line. I don't think it's used it's for that. Did you get iPhone 4? Phone. I did. What do you think of the new phone? Absolutely love it. And you skipped the 3GS. I did. You, did you stay with the iPhone 2 or 3? Uh, it was, well, it's called 3, iPhone right. 3. So you didn't get the faster process or whatever. You spent Correct. the whole year you waited. Right. And uh, you're in love with it, the new one. It's incredible. The speed Why? is ridiculous. Okay, well, you skipped a generation of speed, but right. okay, so it should be ridiculous. Yeah. What else? Yeah, it's not, it, it's not, it's, it's officially a computer now. It's, a, it's not even yeah. a phone. You don't even think yeah. of it as a phone. You think of it as a computer that happens to be usable as a phone. Yeah, which is actually how I look at my iPad. I was listening, I used my iPad, this, I was playing a poker tournament at the Hustler Casino, 60 players came in 7th or 8th, it did really well. Um, and so I was listening to a great Audible book, they used to be a sponsor of the show, they're not a sponsor anymore, hopefully they will be again, um, about uh, the Survivors Club, about people who survived, it was a mm -hmm. bestseller for a long time. And I listened to it on my iPad, because I was like, my iPhone's gonna drain, my iPad lasts for 10 hours, and I just listened to my Audible on my iPad. So I'm sitting there with the headphones in, and I'm holding my iPad, and I realize I could be using the phone. This makes no difference to me. I don't have a whole, carrying the iPad anyway. It might as well be a phone. Anyway, next story. All right, next story. We'll talk about uh, Adly. Uh, they launched last year as an in-stream advertising network for Twitter accounts. Sort of had their business plan interrupted a little last month. Uh, Twitter announced a new policy prohibiting in-stream ads. Uh, Adly's arguing that it does not violate Twitter's terms of service because their ads are not technically served within the Twitter stream. Uh, it's unclear uh, how Twitter feels about that stance. They haven't officially responded. Uh, the company is now continuing to expand into new markets. Uh, they made an announcement that they would insert ads into MySpace streams, and now uh, they're launching an ad network for third-party developers. They're calling uh, Adly Apps. Uh, it's going to allow clients to serve ads to users within Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, or LinkedIn apps. Uh, it launched today, uh, so you can just use an API to serve contextually and locally targeted apps to app user ads to app users based on their stream. Uh, founder Sean Rad is calling it AdSense for the stream. So is this Adley's key to survival post Twitter crackdown, uh, or is this not? Are they going to be able to coexist with Twitter moving forward, as they seem to be thinking? Uh, had... Full disclosure: I am an investor in Tweet Up which mm -hmm. is Bill Gross's version of this, sort of, okay. where he's doing AdSense for, he basically is doing these search boxes like you see on TechCrunch or other places where you can search for something on Twitter. It's a better right. Twitter search, but included in better Twitter search is these sort of like, here are recommended tweeters, and you can sort of like feature listings. Right. Um, so I am not a fan of the selling your tweets and then spamming your users, mm -hmm. but I've softened my position a little bit on it for people who are doing things like, uh, if Kim Kardashian says like, I think everybody should use my sun tanning stuff or whatever, that's right. an ad. Yeah. And if so, so that's her own like. And if I say watch this week in startups, that's an ad. Yeah, I mean a lot of like Twitter. So I mean, how much of this network. all of our stuff is promoting ourselves or the projects we're involved in? Um, as long as there's clear disclosure, I think it's okay with me. I would probably unsubscribe from somebody who did it more than once a week or something because I would just find it annoying. Um, and I think that's probably representative of the general audience. Twitter is going to do what they've always done, which is create a rule set that allows them to have maximum flexibility. Right now, they can say that in-stream advertising like this is not allowed, mm -hmm. but allow it and not crack down to certain players. Or if it becomes incredibly big, they can go wipe that player out. And the uh, real story is not what TweetUp is doing or Adly, although they're doing some innovative things. And I think the putting, putting these kind of promotions in applications is brilliant because yeah. Starbucks or Dish Network or Entertainment Weekly or E! News or these people would certainly buy when you load. If you follow something and get three mana in NG Moco, people would do it. Mm -hmm. you know? Even if they unfollow immediately, at least they would go check it out. And a certain number would, uh, would keep it, so I think that's smart. Um, but just like they, uh, Twitter being they, uh, put out a BlackBerry application and an iPhone application and are the number one, and they throttle down the Twitter API for people who are like Seismic or TweetDeck, mm -hmm. at any point in time, Twitter can just take whatever piece of the ecosystem they want. 
away from whoever maybe has worked hard to get it, and shame on the people who build their services only on top of one service, which is why you see TweetUp and also Adly expanding beyond Twitter, and rightfully so. Yeah, wow. But I also think it's kind of debaggy of Twitter and Facebook and these people to be like, oh, you, you know, we want an API culture around it, but we're going to screw you if you make money. You know, it's right, a sort yeah. of, it's a little debaggy, and people, people are starting to sense that. And I think what I said two years ago on my blog, you know, was like anybody who builds their business on top of one of these other businesses, Facebook, et cetera, is an idiot if they don't diversify and do other things. People, people always say to me, oh, well, Zynga's not an idiot. I said, well, they're going to diversify, and they have. Yeah. And I think Zynga will have more revenue from, more or equal revenue from Xbox, iPad, other places than or Yahoo deal uh, as much or more from other deals than they will inside of Facebook. So diversify, diversify, diversify is the high order bit. Tyler, your thoughts? Um, I heard the, a developer at Twitter did have a conversation on the record with Adley and said that their cur current can continue ad business as usual. Right. They haven't. They haven't officially said how they see Adley fitting into this new policy. Right. But they obviously, for the time being, seem okay with letting Adley survive and prosper. Um, the issue for them is Adley's done a really good job of getting a lot of celebrities involved. So if you were to uh, ban it, you might have the Kardashians calling you, which but I can't think of a more horrible fate might be better <laughs> than having those three women them. call you. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I saw this show. I'm getting a little confused by reality television. Because mm. I saw the three of them. They have a reality show, apparently. Keeping up with the Kardashians. I thought this was a show about transvestites. <laughs> I swear to God, because one of the sisters came, Chloe. came on, and she looked like a football player in a dress. And I said, this is a show about transvestites. And then I saw the other one, and I said, oh, wait, she's the one with the sex tape. Kim. Uh, Kim is the one. But they basically, when you look at them, if you squint a little bit, it's a show about transvestites, I believe. <laughs> and then they're, they're I had all, a, They're all ladies. I'm having. This is why we ladies. need to do a show other than technology. We need to do the Jason Nation show, just where we can just, riff. Yeah. This I'd like to quit everything I'm doing right now and just do a morning show with you guys. Can we just quit everything and just I'm do in. a morning Let's show? Do it. It'd be so much fun if we just did the Jason Nation uh, morning you know, show. Matt Coffin, one of our investors, proposed this to me when we were at South uh, by Southwest. He said, "You just need a just do Howard Stern in the mornings. That's what people really want." People want it, and so if there is a radio executive out there, save me. This entrepreneurial life is exhausting. I'm suffering from headaches. I'm engaging haters constantly. Give me like a, I don't know, how much, what, like a $3 million a year contract? What would it take? $3 million from me in four, $500,000 for each of you a year? I'm in. Is that what it's going to take? Sure. I'd take All right. it. So this is a message to clear, clear stone? Clear channel? Clear, this is a message to clear ch channels senior executives. Uh, four million dollars, three for me. Cheap. Five hundred thousand for each of these guys. What a steal! We will do a morning show, forty weeks a year, four or five days a week. It'll get the same ratings as Imus or Howard Stern or any of these we things. We could I'm beat pretty, Imus. We could take. But I mean, Imus. beating Imus is sort of like build. That's like. <laughs> I, I was going to say an inappropriate joke. No. Um, I'm not going to say it. Uh, it was something about a certain wheelchair league and Michael Jordan, but mm. I can't say that. Anyway. So come up with $4 million. All of us will quit our jobs. We won't have to work on Open Angel Forum anymore. We won't have to do the mm. launch conference. We won't have to. Easy. All these companies will just show up, talk for three hours about what's in the newspaper, sure. and we have the afternoon off. We can, then I can hang out with my kid and play poker. I'm in. This would be a early, much better life. Well, we start at six, seven, seven. We start at seven. That would be so much easier than being an entrepreneur, doing 15 angel invest. It's exhausting what we do. Open angel we farm in so many cities. We just do the investing on the show. People call in with their ideas. I guess so. I just, yeah, we have the Kardashians on the show. That's, that's well, no. So anyway, here's the other insight I have. There's another reality show that I saw on the cover of The Village Voice. Mm -hmm. And it's about Italian people at their summer house these gay Italian guys at their summer house. Hmm. It's called Jersey Shore. <laughs> it's three gay guys who are right. really yes. cut. They're incredible. I won't have you speak of the situation that way. He's actually the lead. He's the he's the, the, he's the real he, hot he, gay he's guy. The abs, abs guy. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I'm watching. I I see this thing, and it's a bunch of guys with their shirts off, mm -hmm. 
cut up like crazy. Gay guys, perfect hair, like a lot of product in the hair. Yes. And um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just these awesomely brilliant, hot, brilliant show. I love gay it. guys uh, just living the life. I'm, here, let me show you a picture of these guys. Eh, there's there's women too. There's Snooky. You've got Snooky in there. No, those are the uh, those are just the look at look at these guys. <laughs> are these the guys from the show? Uh, no, those are just that's just a general photo of oh. some. Uh, I typed in gay guys. What for they me. affectionately would refer to as Guidos. Um, in the best way that's possible. That's not the Jonas Brothers. Oh no, no, those are. You know, it's it's Pauly D. The situation. You got you got Vinny in there. I haven't. I've I've only seen I've, people talk about the show, but apparently. Oh yeah, that was the growing up gaudy kids that you had pulled up. Oh, was it really? Yeah, that's what they're saying in the chat room. So those that that's a sh growing up. That's a show about. It's John Gotti. Young gay guys. No, that's that's John Gotti's family, like his. Oh, uh, oh and Gotti. Yeah. No, that's a very manly guy. <laughs> <Forget what laughs> yeah, I you don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to uh, come down on the Teflon Don. No, but I I saw this cover of the Village Voice. I have to find this cover because it is so funny. Uh, or was it the Village Voice or was one of the weeklies? Uh, somebody in the command There's, central. That's, that's the cast of Jersey Shore you've okay. got there. But now. there are guys who, those Jersey Shore guys were in the Village Voice's queer issue. Uh, and I gotta find the cover because really? Really? it's so great. I mean, it's just a bunch of these Jersey Shore guys uh, who. This is not the last episode of Twist for people in the chat room. Just a little... It's a not little, the last episode little of Little tangents. But anyway, here it is. So this is the cover I see. Yeah, that's them. That's the... Yeah. Those are the... So I, hey, I, I see the queer issue. So apparently... <laughs> what is going on? This is the great... Yes, we're on a tangent. Everybody little relax. Tangent, it, it, little tangent. Little tangent. We should, we should put like a, a little marker of when the tangents are. So this cover I saw... Yeah, that's and Vinny in the situation and I was like, wow, Ronnie. this is a great reality show about gay guys in Jersey. And I was like, I like... Gay guys go to the Jersey Shore because I went to the Jersey Shore when I was a kid. I was like, it was more like Italian guys, but not like, lots of Italian guys. But I'm thinking, and these guys look really fabulous. Anyway, juice heads, yeah, juice heads. That's what they they, they call guys who do a lot of steroids. Oh. juice heads. On the uh, so anyway, these guys, it turns out, didn't know they were going to be on the cover of the Queer Issue, uh, which is yeah. genius. I find it difficult to imagine they would have known that. Yeah, they did not know. I mean, there's nothing you can do to freak out those guys more than putting them on the cover of the. No, really not. I mean, it really is heroic of the, <laughs> of the village <laughs> boys to do that. Oh, last story, please. Oh, I think that was the last story. Good. Me, All right, one hour and 35 minutes. Oh, we no, we, got, we have one more. You want to do one more? We're going to do it in 90 seconds. Well, 90 Derek's seconds, okay. Me. Music licensing company Rumblefish has announced a new online store, Friendly Music. It enables YouTube users to buy a lifetime worldwide music license for selected tracks for $1.99 a pop. Currently, the catalog contains three... 35,000 copyright cleared songs, new ones are being added daily. Uh, but here's the interesting part to me, the, the side note, the service only applies for user-generated, non-commercial, non-professional videos. If you're a partner, meaning uh, you get paid an additional uh, adjacent or embedded advertising fee on YouTube, you need to negotiate your own additional fee. So presumably they want to take a, a portion of what you're making. So does this have legs the, if it's only for people who aren't making videos for a profit? What is the name of the service? Uh, the, the company is called Rumblefish Friend Friendly Music is the name of the actual service. Nice try, but this is not important. That's the end of the show. It, it's, I mean, the music companies have solved this problem already. The music companies are going in and claiming the advertising rights on things. The music industry is never going to make it easy. Mm -hmm. Like the television e industry is starting to make it easy. The music industry is just horrible. And I like it how, because we're a, we have a partnership account, had we been able to do this, we could put in these songs for a buck ninety nine and still maintain all the revenue. On, they wouldn't be able to claim our videos. <sighs> when they I first just heard about it, I was really excited because I thought, oh, this is fantastic. We have all these YouTube shows. Right. I'd love to use all this music. Right. And then you read it it's like, no, what? but only what? if you don't make a profit. So basically, yeah. the people who are using it for private use should have use of it, right? Wasn't there like a whole case where somebody fought it and they won? Where they uh, had their baby. Let's go crazy, the woman with let's get the camera. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, okay, if you want to dance to a song on YouTube that's copyrighted, you should be allowed to. It's not hurting anybody, like a home video. So now they're saying that stuff that is actually legal, you can pay to make it legal, even though it's legal you already. Would a, you could pay a buck ninety nine for something that's probably legal anyway. Well, you wouldn't or have arguably. To, you wouldn't have to worry about getting your video pulled. You would have full rights to that song where. Which is ridiculous. You to put that's like it. saying, oh, if you would like to have fair use of this article and to quote it, you can pay us for fair use. 
It's like, well, it's fair use. It's already, you know, if somebody wants to clip 30 seconds of the show to make an editorial point about it, that's fair use. Yeah, but if I wanted to do like a vlog and I wanted to have oh. a song playing behind me the whole time, I, I would have to pay for that song yeah. right now. So this would be a cheap If they were smart, the music industry would say, you can use any of our songs. We get the first 20, we get the first $100 in revenue and then we will split it 50-50 after that. If you apply and you let us approve it in advance, and they would just get a team of people to approve these things and make sure it's not pornographic. Or they could say, we get the first $100 in and then we split it 50-50. Yeah, something and like something that. Something like that, where most of them are never going to break 100 Yeah, and then if you do, you pay. Right. I'd, I'd, yeah. So that they're saying maybe you could work out something like that through the service, but it's not really designed for that. It's so designed no, for they never, the vloggers who aren't partners and, and don't really make money. They will never make it easy because the music industry is filled with like all these diverse old people who are riding out the last 10 years of their careers to get to their pensions. And so when everybody wants to understand why this doesn't work, look at ASCAP or some of these other places that were just harassing people. It's just like this massive harassment and they, they just, these old people in these positions of power in a fragmented industry where there's like 20 different rights organizations, how many rights organizations are there in this industry? For music alone, you have, and it goes beyond just the song, it goes into performance rights. Right, that's what I'm saying, there's, yeah, there's at crazy. least a half dozen, yeah. dozen ones that you recognize the names of. Mm -hmm. ASCAP, BMI, this, that, the other thing. I don't know what they're for. And they all want to basically retire in 10 years. And all they're doing is just, can you please can I just get through another 42 months? This other guy's got 30 months. This guy's got 16 months. They're trying to ride it out so they can retire, which is why they're missing the opportunity. Whereas the TV guys are a bunch of young guys who are like, I gotta be here for another 30 years making television shows. I'm gonna make this work. We're gonna get Hulu, we're gonna invest, we're gonna make a service. Boom, it's gonna work. Well, there's, there's that, the biggest difference between the two is anyone can make music more or less now at, from home. Right. Not everyone can make a TV show from home. Of that, of that to make, the, the standard of quality yeah, yeah. to make I a professionally sa good sounding song. Video takes five times more. It, there's still a huge technical hurdle to make Correct. content of that quality, but in music, it, there's not. You can more or less make killer quality music from home. Garage band. Boom. Thank you for tuning into this week in startups. Can I make one more announcement? <laughs> I just a last minute email has come in. Uh, uh oh. We, 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 we got a hater? I, 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 I can say we have get? a second. Uh, her name is uh, Mixie. She will be joining us on oh, the Friday show. Fantastic. Provided it's not a shouting match and you don't try to run roughshod over her points. That's, then she I, agrees. I that. guarantee everybody who knows I will not. I had the guys on from Koretsu Forum. I let people talk. You can talk for Mixie five minutes about your incorrect points. <laughs> we'll all just sit here and roll our eyes for those five minutes. No, we'll and be then very I will respect. We'll be very respectful. Very respectful. And then I will explain to you the reality of your lives. Mm -hmm. One last time, this is the fi for a final engagement no of guns. haters. No guns for that show. I will not bring a knife to a gunfight. No, I'm no. bringing a nuclear bomb. No, okay. seriously, this will be hand-to-hand -hand combat. I will be courteous to everybody, but I, will, I am on Friday show, and it's, I think the show is only going to be live streamed. We're not going to release the tape of it. Oh. So if you you either see it live, you have to catch it Friday at one p.m. Friday at one p.m. Live viewing only. The show will be destroyed after that. <laughs> It'll only be forty nine ninety nine. And I, that. it's it. Only you watch it live or you don't see it. I'm joking. We can't do that. Unless we have you're sponsors. On TV. We'll it, we're, it'll we'll be on die. iTunes. People are panicking. We'll, we'll release. We'll it. do it live. Anyway, I will be courteous to them. Yes, we very. Respect. But I'm not going to pull punches. For the last time, I will engage that jaders. But my. I'm serious, it's the last time I'm ever going to do it for the rest of the year. Because I don't have the mental energy anymore. I'm suffering from headaches. I've got too much on my plate. I'm not having any like, nervous breakdown or anything like that people are saying. I'm just getting headaches because the rain comes over to my shoulder. I got all this bright life over here. And the rain comes over and I got to brush my shoulder off constantly. I'm tired of brushing this off my shoulder. And I'm telling everybody with peace and love, peace and love, here it is on my laptop. I have peace and love. This is a serious message to everybody watching my update right now. Peace and love. Peace and love. I want to tell you, please, after 
the 20th of October, do not send fan mail to any address that you have. Nothing will be signed after the 20th of October. If that has a date on the envelope, it's going to be tossed. I'm warning you with peace and love, but I have too much to do. So no more fan mail. Thank you, thank you. And no objects to be signed. Nothing. Uh, anyway, peace and love, peace and love. <laughs> peace and love. Peace and love. love. I'm going to throw your mail away. Peace and love. <laughs> I'm telling you, with, I'm warning you, I have too much to do with peace and love. Peace and love. No more Jaders. Friday. After Friday, July 1st. Is it the first on Friday? Friday is the second. After Friday, July 1st, do not send any hate to any email address or Twitter address you have. I am warning you with peace and love. Your hate will be tossed. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Spiked out, I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from. No.